Ms. May. Good afternoon. This is Dialogue Conspiracy. Uh, we'll take a wide range of subjects, all involving conspiracies. We originally, when I went on the air two years ago, we used to talk about the conspiracy to kill Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King, and John Kennedy, and now the apex of power is coming in so heavy and the conspirators are visible in your daily newspapers if you look at it carefully. So we're going to point out some of the effects of the assassinations and not so much the evidence that there was a conspiracy. Um, one of the news articles that came in this evening was the um, uh, capturing of some Americans and foreign diplomats over in Saudi Arabia. There was a party at reception at the ambassadors, and two high-ranking diplomats have been taken as hostages, U.S. Ambassador Cleo Noel and George Moore, and other foreign diplomats, and the Black September group have asked San Quentin to release Sirhan Sirhan. Now, whether they'll kill all these hostages like they did at the time of the Olympic Games is anybody's guess. I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, they might, but they want Sirhan back. Um, after last week, the Supreme Court had a vote, they voted seven to nothing to refuse to hear the evidence that Sirhan was uh, not the person that killed Robert Kennedy. So you do get to the point where uh, maybe they feel that he isn't getting a fair shake in the United States, and they want to uh, uh, bring him over some other way. If the Supreme Court won't allow the ballistic evidence to be introduced, not even to hear it, that he didn't kill Robert Kennedy. Uh, maybe out of desperation, this group feels that that's their only alternative because he's just sitting there and uh, they're going to help him uh, escape one way or the other. He isn't going to do it by the legal processes in the United States. So that's the news on that. Pat Reed Gray is fighting very hard to get confirmed in, before the Senate committee. The judiciary, he wants to be the head of the FBI. There are other articles that we'll discuss the news this week. Uh, go into Patrick Gray that are just outrageous. We did a show last week on the radio. I spoke about reasons why he shouldn't be the head of the FBI. And if you didn't write a letter, you should. Uh, Patrick Gray said this evening that a, a law violation would have to be involved before he would investigate any leaks of FBI documents by White, White House aides. There were many law violations involved that he has not investigated as the acting head of the FBI, including the shooting of Governor Wallace, the evidence of a conspiracy. The federal government never pressed charges against Arthur Bremer. They haven't even intended to. The weapons would show there was a conspiracy. The financing, he, that was a violation. The ITT deal that Patrick Gray did as the assistant under clients in the Justice Department was a law violation. He worked with Senator Eastland, and we'll go into that a little more in detail, and uh, sent Howard Hunt out to Colorado to discredit Mrs. Beard and to say that, that the memo that uh, disclosed the ITT's deals with John Mitchell to make a deal at the time of the uh, Republican convention in, in San Diego, they were going to get $400,000 in exchange for getting off a suit in the Justice Department. Uh, that was a law violation, and he was in on that deal to squelch the ITT thing. Um, I just could do a whole program on law violations. So Patrick Gray has been involved in covering up in the Justice Department and as the acting head of the FBI. So uh, he's hiding behind a lot of innocence. His memos from the FBI have slipped to the hands of ITT, and he says, I don't know how they got there. They gave Donald Segretti information before he went before the grand jury on what to say. They coached him on the questions. They told him the questions would be easy at the Watergate affair. Patrick Gray said that wasn't a violation of law, but a breach of trust. What kind of a man is going to be acting head of the FBI? He has every excuse to get out of um, the job of investigating who's doing the criminal acts in this country. And he is using all kinds of verbal uh, roads to get around the fact that he has made uh, his eyes look the other direction when there were law violations and he himself is making law violations as a member of the Justice Department and is acting head of the FBI. This evening, Thursday, up in Santa Cruz, um, it was announced on KLRB before, but I don't want to forget it, there's going to be a showing of the Zabruder film and a lecture about the assassination of John Kennedy. 
and a young man, Rusty Rhodes, is going to show the slides at 50 cents at Merrill Hall up in Santa Cruz at 7.30 this evening, Thursday. He'll show the Zapruder films, The Killing of John Kennedy, and the evidence that there was the conspiracy in Dallas. So if you can get up from Carmel to Santa Cruz by that hour, by 7.30, Merrill Dining Hall, it's 50 cents, and you can see those slides, and I think you'll find them really interesting. You get a background of what happened in 1963. It's in your local neighborhood. Last week we uh, talked about the Santa Cruz uh, murders, the arrest of Mr. Mullen, and um, I believe that a good hunk of those murders are done by provocateurs like the Oda family. I think that narcotics and a court case was involved. I believe the Santa Cruz people have been very quiet this week. I haven't seen them press charges against Mr. Mullen. The only news that's come out of Santa Cruz this week is that professionals cut up the four girls, Cynthia Ann Shaw, Alice Lou, and Rosalind Thorpe, cut up their hands and bodies. I know they were professionals. They're looking at meat packing places. That's a good place. You have to see these movies on the syndicate or the mafia because they were used for other conspiracies along with the CIA and FBI. Uh, there are political reasons for coming down on segments of our society at the present time to spread terror, to escalate the police force, to get come down on the youth generation further, the kids that are camping, and spread terror among people that hitchhike or basically trust each other. There's an internal civil war and a chaos, and this is just one of the symptoms of it. And uh, when they announced that there are professionals in the murder of the four girls, there are. And uh, watch it this next week. It's been very quiet the last week. And um, I have some pretty good leads on situations up there, but there's nowhere to take them to because in every case of a conspiracy, the police department's involved. So the question is, where do you take the information? You're caught in a system where the Justice Department, the Treasury, the Central Intelligence Agency, and the FBI work together, and they work with certain police departments to spread terror. And who do you take the information to? A uh, admission was made by Richard Helms that the CIA was working with the police departments. He didn't see anything wrong with that. And I got an article from Houston, Texas this week, a detailed article about the congressman investigating the CIA working with the police department, and the man who justifies this now is John Maury, M-A-U-R-Y. He is the chief legal counsel, the head attorney now for the CIA, and he, he defends the fact that the police department can be briefed by the Central Intelligence Agency, and furthermore, he says the agency intends to continue to respond to requests on matters within its confidence, and it will continue to work in the police department. Well, why shouldn't the Central Intelligence Agency work with police departments? Because it's the covert department, the planning department, killing innocent people, planning the evidence against other persons, affecting the whole milieu of our climate in this country, spreading terror, uh, forging documents, using false aliases and passports for the guilty to make getaways. That's the black covert department that they're using in the police departments. The, the CIA is u working in Houston, and uh, when it works with the police departments, it's teaching them how to do illegal things, too, that are covert and clandestine, that are against the interests of the entire range of this country. They serve a few people. As a matter of fact, they just serve the conglomerate corporations. There's an investigation going on right now in Washington. It's the, uh, the Senate, Mr. Church, Frank Church of Idaho. His committee, it's called the Senate uh, Committee to Investigate the, the ITT. It's based upon charges that Allende made that the ITT and the CIA and the armed forces were overthrowing the government in Chile, and uh, Elendi, the president of Chile, took it to the United Nations this December. And he said the American government is creating chaos. Number one, they affect elections. They cause economic crisis. They bring civil war. They want to remove Elendi from the election when he was a popular leader, and they provoke a government crisis. 
But what you're seeing in this country is the identical pattern of the special forces creating chaos. They affect our elections. The same ITT and CIA and armed forces that was that is being investigated in Congress now by a select group. It's called the Senate Foreign Relations Subcommittee on Multinational Corporations. And the investigation is going on right now. And what they're investigating is the effect of ITT and corporations to cause economic crisis in another country. But they're not investigating what they do in the United States. You see, the Senate can take that and investigate this cause. And the only reason it's coming to a head is not because it's illegal, immoral, it causes violences and killings, it causes civil war, turns people against each other. That's not why the Senate's investigating it or investigating the CIA. They're only investigating it because Allende confiscated American uh, corporations down there and, and took over the copper mines and there was a moral or a business a question, not a moral actually, it goes down to business. Was he justified in confiscating these things? At what point does the provocation get so great from America that he is justified to take over? And, and so the Congress, the Senate now, is investigating. And they have memos that Richard Nixon gave the green light to do anything short of the Dominican Republic. Ellsworth Bunker uh, arranged that um, bloody Dominican Republic scene that made it a military dictatorship. He then goes on to Vietnam where, you know, involved with Diem and, and Thu and that fake election. They overturned the election or tried to. They weren't successful of Allende. They were successful in the United States with our candidates. Uh, they work as a team, the CIA and the large conglomerates. And then they give orders. They give orders and Richard Nixon gives them their permission to do what they want because they give him the money to buy the television time and the propaganda to make himself elected. So there's a vicious circle now. So the huge conglomerate is being investigated. Now the ITT that is being investigated by this committee for overthrowing, uh, trying to overthrow Chile, creating chaos and economic hardship. The same ITT is mentioned in our newspapers this week in conjunction with Patrick Gray. Uh, a long article in the Washington Post and a small one in today's Chronicle, this Thursday's, by Jack Anderson is the link of Howard Hunt, who was arrested at the Watergate Hotel, and the White House to the ITT scandal last year. And the, the importance of the whole, I'm going it's a very complicated story and it has to do with if altering elections, creating chaos, and conspiracy in the United States. And I'm trying to try to make it as simplified as I can that the ITT, as I said, was being investigated by the Justice Department for, um, they were going to be involved in an antitrust suit. And John Mitchell was the head of the Justice Department and intervened if they would give $400,000 to help support Richard Nixon's campaign and have the convention in San Diego. Those were the conditions. He would turn the Justice Department in favor of ITT decision. Now that is one thing that was really, you know, as the head of the Justice Department and the head of the raising of campaigns for Richard Nixon, he would get money in exchange for having the convention down there. And the location of San Diego was as important as the 400,000. The money isn't as important as the location because that is where Louis Tackwood, the agent provocateur, said earlier in the fall of 71 where violence was going to be created and the government would be overthrown and we'd have martial law. Now, all the agents, all the money, the Marine base down there, the military was all ready for that operation. And in March, when the ITT memo was discovered, and Dita Baird came forth with, and admitted to Jack Anderson that she wrote the memo that, that broke this whole uh, thing open, when, in March, when this took place, the decision was they had to move the conventions to Miami. Now, that strategically delayed the martial law that Tagwood talked about. All the espionage team were in the White House, 
They're there now. They're moving out into our communities, working all together. But Charles Coulson, in March of 1971, took Howard Hunt and asked him to go out to Denver, Colorado, and discredit Dita Barrett. Now, Dita Barrett had said in February that she had signed this particular uh, memo. In March, our Hunt is paid in the White House $100 a day by you taxpayers. I keep saying you're going to have your taxes coming up soon. And Charles Colson is paid by the taxpayers. He's in the White House as an attorney to Richard Nixon. He sends Howard Hunt out to Denver, Colorado with a ridiculous red wig, which was found later at the Watergate Hotel at the time of the rest. He goes to the osteopathic hospital in Denver and he, uh, Robert Baird, Mrs. Baird's uh, son, who's 24 years old, uh, said he had an eerie red wig, a cockeyed wig, and he looked silly, like he put on the dark. He used an alias, Edward Hamilton, which was also used by Frank Sturgis. This false identity was made out by the Central Intelligence Agency. He used this alias and went out to see her, and after his conversation with her, she announced that the memo that she had was a forgery and a fake. She not only announced it, but she had a senator, Senator uh, Scott, get up on the floor of the Senate and say that an injustice had been an injustice had been done to America. It was a forgery and a hoax. Senator Scott from Pennsylvania read on the floor of the Senate. Well, at the time Howard Hunt of the Watergate espionage team was out in Denver, Colorado telling Dita Baird that she was going to say this was a forgery and hoax. Our dear Patrick Gray III, working in the Justice Department, had taken a hold of this memo, this controversial memo, and the FBI had said that the memo indicated that Dita Baird did indeed sign it. But they're going to tell her Howard Hunt and Charles Colson are going to have a press release from the floor of the Senate and so forth that she didn't. The FBI said that she signed this memo. But what were they going to do with that? That wasn't good enough. So Patrick Gray saw to it that it was given to ITT, which is the same com conglomerate, the same CIA that caused chaos over in, in Chile and in about 70 other countries, but is just becoming vulnerable in our own country. So Patrick Gray saw that this ITT memo from the Justice Department, I mean, the, the the one that Dita Baird had about the conventions and settling the case by the Justice Department, he saw that it got into the ITT hands. Now, ITT gave it to Intertel. That's their famous police investigative agency. And in March 72, Intertel looked at the memo. And the White House had decided it was a forgery or hoax. ITT was very cautious. The FBI said it was an accurate document. So the private investigators from this particular firm that they, that they use went to examine the manual to see if it was a genuine one or a forgery. Now the same person who handed it over to their officials of ITT was Mullen Associates, the man, the agency that handles the empire of Howard Hughes. Now our plot gets a little thicker. Howard Hughes uh, uses Mullen Incorporated for all of his contracts for his multi-national, uh, international empire. And it was Mullen Associates that Howard Hunt also worked. He went between the White House and Mullen Associates. You see Howard used in the aerospace industry and the ITT and the White House and the Justice Department. All work is one. It's, if you haven't got that little... It's a 20-page article I wrote for The Realist, and I have them at the Thunderbird. If you haven't read the outline of how this country is structured, I wrote that last July. I'm not trying to sell The Realist. It's only 50 cents, but it's a good background to understand today's news if you could pick them up at the Thunderbird, because I made these charges last July, three weeks after the men were arrested at the Watergate Hotel. And the use of the aerospace and the conglomerates and, and the control of Nixon as a clandestine agent, not a Republican, but as a spokesman for the aerospace industry since 45, Hughes has 
funded his career, that he was handpicked for his career as the front man for these conglomerates. They have uh, assassinated everyone that stood in his way of being president. The team works hand in glove. And so this week, it, it shows the links of Howard Hunt going from the White House out to Denver at the same time that, that Howard Hunt is working with the Watergate team, who's later going to be affecting the uh, conventions down in Miami, they hoped. But the Intertel, the international police that Howard Hughes used, was cautious on the memo. They couldn't come to an absolute positive opinion on the forgery. They said it was inconclusive, and their findings were very vague. They, they said the if it wasn't a forgery, definitely. Uh, they couldn't come. It was inconclusive in it, probably. Well, those are the two words that wrote the whole Warren report. Mark Lane once said, you know, we should, researchers should sit down and take every probably, because that's all that was holding it up. Intertel said, and they only had one copy of the memo, and that was given to them by Patrick Gray, because the FBI... All the FBI said it was Dita Baird's memo, and Dita Baird said it was. So Patrick Gray gets it in the hands of Intertel, and they say it probably was her typewriter, but it was difficult to establish. So uh, we learn from all of this, from this news article, that the Bennett Associates is the contact man for the use empire, and Intertel gets into the Dita Baird um, International police, our FBI isn't good enough to investigate that. And Mr. Bennett of Mullen Associates tells the White House it probably was a forgery, it's inconclusive. And then Mr. Colson gets a message from Mr. Bennett. He gives it to him, the White House lawyer, and Colson orders Howard Hunt out to Denver. And then after that, then Mrs. Baird says, I didn't write it. It was, it was, uh, a forgery. And then, to show you, you know, Howard Hunt is a writer. He writes for this administration, and he's very patriotic. Everything he said, and Bernard Bark and all the people involved in the conspiracy have been very patriotic. This is what Dita Baird said. She gave a statement on March the 17th, in quotes. I did not prepare it, the memo, and I could not have, and I've done nothing to be ashamed of, and my family and I in a greater sense, the whole American government are victims of a fraud. As if we are victims, that is true, and we're victims of perjury, we're victims of conglomerates buying off the Justice Department, controlling the Justice Department, putting men in like Patrick Gray and John Mitchell or Robert Martin, who are part of this conglomerate, they represent them. And every law that needs to be broken is broken. The federal government and Justice Department fixes cases for these people. They forge documents and records. They allow perjury about for special funds or interest. They allow the conglomerates to control it. They discredit people. They move Dita Baird from her home in Washington out to Colorado, and they make her look like she's drunk or crazy, like they did with Martha Mitchell. They wear wigs and passports and aliases. These are the law enforcement men hired to maintain law and order. And the CIA supplies them on our salary to go out and disguise themselves. If, if Howard Hunt wanted to find out from Dita Baird himself, he, all he had to do was walk and say, I'm Howard Hunt from the White House. I'm the attorney for Richard Nixon and Charles Colson, and I want to know, tell me yourself, did you sign the memo? No, after she says she did sign it, he visits her carefully disguised with this crazy sideway wig, his red wig, and then the whole story begins to change. But in this article, in this series of the ITT, you see the CIA, the ITT working together using all the methods that they used that I cross-filed under the Warren Report. I, I can't emphasize it enough. The, the, uh, forgeries, the aliases, the use of the Justice Department to pervert justice at every, everywhere you turn. There was another article about perverting justice. This is a, it was in the article this week, it was in the paper. A man by the name of Robert Vesco, and this ties in with the Watergate, and it ties in with John Mitchell and Patrick Gray. 
A man by the name of Robert Vesco was being investigated by the Security Exchange, Exchange Commission. And it, there was a multi-million dollar international swindle. <laughs> the stock exchange was involved, there were 20 individuals involved in a suit, 21 corporations, it's going on now, $224 million were misappropriated in mutual funds. And they were taken to Geneva, Switzerland. And Robert Vesco was involved and he was arrested in Geneva, Switzerland. And John Mitchell picks up the telephone and asks them to send home Mr. Vesco from Switzerland. And he does. And he says in exchange, he, Vesco was to give him $200,000 towards the re-election of Richard Nixon. And Donald Nixon was in in this exchange too. And so was Maurice Stans, former Secretary of Commerce. So Robert Vesco comes in, and we don't have the full story yet, but uh, Edward Nixon, President Nixon's brother, confirmed that all the money that was given to the committee to re-elect Richard Nixon by Mr. Vesco in exchange for not being prosecuted, offered to him by John Mitchell, who intervened, was to come in cash. Now, the cash comes to the safe of Maurice Stance, the head of the uh, committee now, the fundraiser, to re-elect Richard Nixon. And it's not accounted for, and it comes in along with that $89,000 in Mexican checks, that espionage money, that floating fund of illegal, that money that's, that finances illegal and criminal acts that keeps moving along, money given to John Mitchell or Maurice Stans in exchange for not being investigated in cases that are supposed to go before the court. So that 200000 went into the safe of Maurice Stans, and that money then went to G. Gordon Liddy, who was convicted in the Watergate case, he was the counsel, the finance counsel for the re-election of Richard Nixon. Now, Vesco never reported. Uh, the contribution was never reported by the committee, along with hundreds of thousands of dollars. Money, goodness knows how much isn't reported. And the point is, a law was made that after April the 7th, money given to the committee to re-elect Richard Nixon would be reported. But can you imagine there's supposed to be a floating fund of $10 million to $20 million that went through Mullen Associates, which is the Howard Hughes Group and the ITT Group that went into the committee to re-elect Richard Nixon. Can you imagine how many cases have been settled before April, the money went in before April 7th, how many cases in the Justice Department have been settled, how many rivers have been polluted, how many people have gotten off from criminal charges, how many uh, skies are being polluted because we have information of a lot of people that got off on uh, car manufacturers and so forth, give us money, we won't put these controls on. The bad air in the cities, the bad oceans where things are being dumped, the bad rivers, the fish being contaminated, 10 to $20 million in donations that they will not reveal the names of. If they, we just have the names of the people that gave money from April the 7th until the election time, then June when they were caught, of course, everything was, no more was given then. Can you imagine how it would affect our society if these things were really investigated just from those dates on. We could overthrow this entire espionage government and get back a democracy and a two-party system if we just investigated who gave the money for what purposes from April the 7th on. We could have a whole new form of government without terror and massacres and phony plane crashes. I'm going into one of those, another one this week with a pilot had its instrument panel tampered. That's four since December. But in this Vesco case, the money was not put down. Now, what was the reason? I, I want to read this to you, uh, the, the excuse they gave of being late and not having to report it, because when your taxes come around in April, you don't have to pay your tax if your intent was to pay your taxes. And they come in two or three weeks late. All you have to say that it was in your mind to do it, because their excuse was that the President's re-election committee said this last Tuesday, the contributions didn't have to be reported because it was, quote, constructively in the hands of the campaign committee, which means 
now this is in quotes, that there wasn't physically in their hands by April the 7th, but they promised the contribution in March. So it was constructively in their hands. So if you, maybe if you promise to pay your taxes in April, you can just let them go till May or June. If you, in quotes, constructively made an agreement, they'd be coming along. If you're short of tax money, just put down that the law date doesn't mean anything to you because it doesn't mean anything to the law and order crowd. There's an April 7th date, and they couldn't meet that date. Now, one of the reasons for the late money flowing in and the desperation to get it of Maurice Stans and John Mitchell and Robert Martin, and they're flying all over the place to get it, had to do with the Tagwood allegations that I've talked about before, because when the ITT scandal came out and the memos were was disclosed, convention had to be moved, the Republican convention, from San Diego to Miami by the summer. Now that gave them from March to the summer to move the convention. But all the money for the paid provocateurs had to be in by April. That's one month to maybe hand out $10 million that doesn't have to be accounted for later because all the other money spent you see, Lewis Tackwood and all these people out in California and 50 other states, wherever they were, were coming. The money, the law enforcement, the aliases, all the hotel reservations, I'm sure everything was set for that violence. It was going to look like it was spontaneous. And all the funding was concealed so you couldn't trace or get into their books any more than you can get into them now. But just the physical mechanics of moving that convention from March and having no money show of where it came from, from April the 7th, couldn't be done. So they got caught with a little of their money dribbling around. The men arrested at the Watergate Hotel, Frank Sturgis and Bernard Barker, Martinez, Gonzalez, they were making reservations down in Miami, and they had a lot of agents coming. They had a rented car with a lot of weapons in it, and they were expecting a pretty hot time in the old town in Miami. And provocateurs said there was going to be so much violence. I talked about one last week. Lemons, he told his girlfriend, don't come down there. There's going to be a lot of killing going on. But that takes money. It takes money because people just don't do that for nothing, not for love. Some do it for patriotic reasons. But the real organizers, it takes money. And you can't raise it from March to April. So a lot of this heavy cash was flowing in unaccounted for. And it went to the safe of Maurice Stans. Now, Mr. Um, Harry Sears, a New Jersey attorney, he's worked for the president's re-election campaign in New Jersey, and he tells about a man delivering the cash in a black attache case to Maurice Stans. Everything, the wigs, the aliases, and everything is a total espionage team, synchronized. They just happen to get caught. But Mr. Vesco, uh, ha so far, has not had any trouble with the law enforcement agencies. Three months after John Mitchell intervened on his behalf and he had been arrested in Geneva, he came home and the U.S. Embassy had inquired about him and the reasons for his arrest and he was released and he's home. And the newspaper went on to say the charges involving the stockholders' complaint were dropped. That's $214 million mutual funds. It says, this is the Washington Post, February the 28th, 1973, the charges were dropped. Now, John Mitchell says, that wasn't anything. I did it for a personal friend. John Mitchell was a lawyer for Rockefeller, worked at, with the Wall Street, the security exchanges. What is $224 million mutual funds case? And it, it says here, the stockholder's complaint was dropped. It was dropped just like the... Supreme Court wouldn't hear the evidence that Sirhan didn't kill Robert Kennedy. And then they go on to say, John Mitchell said, normally this thing would go through other sources in the department. Normally the application of this man to come home would go through the State Department. But he said, it's not unusual to call for a call like that to come to the Justice Department. Well, it's not unusual when John Mitchell is serving so many of his friends. I, You know, you can make a whole filing cabinet of cases that were given in favor of persons under conviction or suspect for large amounts of money to the Richard Nixon campaign 
through John Mitchell, Patrick Gray, just add them all up. They're coming in. The news is coming in so heavy during the week. And it all links together because the American taxpayer, the Democratic Party, the Peace and Freedom, whatever your political affiliations, you're being sabotaged by this whole team. And the Justice Department is turning the whole term justice upside down. It's the Department of... Uh, it's just... It's a perversion of the word justice. That's, that's what it really is. Uh, there's another example of justice. There was an article this week about George Wallace, that the peace between George Wallace and President Nixon may be coming to an end. I hope it comes to an end. I never thought that George Wallace could be silenced so heavily to not tell who tried to shoot him. I thought that his dander would be up and that he would be furious. And I've called down there many times out of Alabama, made long-distance calls, and was sure that, that the American Independent Party and the people that, that were interested in George Wallace would not pull a uh, Robert Kennedy, where he allowed his brother to be killed, or a Ted Kennedy, where he let the evidence of Robert and John be silenced. But some control is over on these men. It takes time. It takes a lot of years of saving files and cross-filing to understand how history or people move. And there was an article just this week that Richard Nixon sat in an airplane in 1971 in May with George Wallace from Mobile, Alabama. They took a flight. And on that flight, they discussed several things. One was the criminal tax investigation of Wallace's brother, Gerald. Now, that has a lot of similar, the criminal tax investigation. Now, that has a lot of similarities because James Ray, who was the alleged assassin of Martin Luther King, his brother was involved with the law department and the justice department, and they don't put the squeeze on him as long as he just keeps quiet, you know, about his brother. And Suryan's brothers could be deported, and they were in trouble with the law, and they, they are afraid if they talk too much, they will be deported too, you see, and arrested. So they have the hold on them. Well, Wallace's brother was in on some criminal charges too, and there was an article in the paper this week, in case you missed it, the president Nixon had a little plane ride in May 71 and discussed Gerald uh, Wallace's problems with the Justice Department. Here we go again with the Southern strategy, John Mitchell and the Wallace Department. Now, one of the agreements they asked Governor Wallace to do was to get the Democratic nomination rather than the American Independent because they wanted to be sure that the president would get all the conservative votes and they wouldn't be drained by the Wallace candidacy. And this was a kind of a thing that uh, Wallace said, I'll run as a Democrat, you see, and I won't run as American independent. But the American people seemed to, not a lot of them, Michigan, a few states, uh, were going to Wallace. Enough votes, 20, 22 million, and no matter what Democratic candidate you had running against Richard, against Richard Nixon, Nixon needed those 22 million. He, he needed that for his mandate, and he coaxed Wallace, run uh, as a Democrat, you know, don't take my votes away. But involved in this deal, evidently, was the uh, criminal investigation of the brother. Well, right now, George Wallace is suffering and supposedly doped up in constant pain, and Gerald Wallace runs Montgomery, Alabama from the Capitol, he dispenses the state contracts, the leases, and other favors. So he's almost acting like a governor instead of being criminally investigated by the same John Mitchell Justice Department. But the Southern strategy of uh, Fred LaRue in the White House working with John Mitchell and Eastland, Senator Eastland and Wallace, the elimination of Wallace, culminated the Southern strategy. There wasn't anything left to do but to shoot the man. He was just too much of a competition and the conglomerate and the powers that be. I'm absolutely convinced when they set their mind that we need this many votes, they'll get it by hook or by crook. And the only reason I say that is just open up the evidence and the archives and count the bullets in the shopping center that, that shot Wallace and go into where he stayed at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel and you'll find that his life was tampered with in order to make sure that he did not run for president in 1972. Now, on the last two shows last week and the week before, we talked about Israel, the Middle East. I, I said if nothing came in in the news, we'd do a whole show 
about the Middle East. I promised that two weeks ago. But there's so much news of a conspiratorial nature coming in that, that I have not been able to spend the entire time, which I'd like to do, on why the Middle East is escalating the movement of Richard Helms of the CIA into Iran. Uh, well, he, they just bought $2 billion worth of hardware this last week. Uh, I can't remember if I mentioned the week before or not, the Shah of Iran. You know where that's going to go, right back into our backs. But the news from the Middle East has to do but nothing but escalate now. It's going to get very heavy. And the energy crisis, I wanted to review some books for you on the phony ed energy crisis, which creates the rationalization for doing to Israel what the oil people have agreed to do for a long time in exchange for the oil. We, the CIA group coming out of Houston, Texas, the Friends of the Middle East, John Conley's friends have been siphoning money into these uh, Arab terrorists and... Uh, Controlling the situation, I, one of the things I know is that the Greek Orthodox Church was the CIA conduit of funds that brought the Sirhan family over here in the first place in 1948. And maybe this whole uh, guerrilla movement is to get him back like they promised after a particular thing was accomplished, namely taking care of a candidate, again, who ran against Richard Nixon. Well, I talked about uh, terror in our community's airplane that crashed in Alameda and the doctor that was ready at the hospital. The pilot uh, wasn't awake or aware at the time. We've talked about the airplane that crashed in Chicago in December. The wife of Howard Hunt was on, and that pilot had died of cyanide poisoning, and he wasn't awake at the time. And a week later, two, United, two airlines, another United, crashed over the same field in Chicago. They had cyanide poisoning. Well, in the Middle East this week, um, the black box, in quotes, shows that the airline, airline pilot mistook the wrong location. I'm talking about the plane that Israel shot down and is told to pay uh, for the, the terrible thing they did. They shot down um, a Lisbon airline with civilians on it flying over Israel. And a few weeks ago, Jack Anderson had intelligence information that a plane would come over Israel over a certain section. It would be loaded. They think it was a sad passenger plane. It was going to drop bombs in Tel Aviv. And Israel was acting, acting defensively. So Israel said Friday that the flight recorder of the Libyan airliner that was shot down showed that the pilots thought they were over Egypt. Somebody, the flight recorder is called the black box. And... The article that I have said in quotes, it may be assumed that the plane's crew erred completely in its orientation and after the tapes were decoded. There's one other thing I want to talk about real quickly. We have about four minutes, and it's another parallel. I'm going to jump from the Israel thing with the airplanes being tampered with and the planes not alive. The eastern market is getting bad lettuce, and I want to show you the comparisons of the Central Intelligence Agency messing up the lettuce crop of Cesar Chavez and the Carmel Valley that's going all over the world. If you want to send for the microfilm of the New York Times, any of you that are serious investigators, in April 28, 1966, John Kennedy objected to the fact that a boat leaving, Puerto leaving Cuba loaded with sugar that, that was picked by the Cubans, the sugar crop, had a propeller damaged, and the propeller could not go on to deliver that sugar that they had raised to keep their economy going. It was supposed to go to the Soviet Union. The propeller was damaged, and the ship was put in dry dock conveniently in San Juan, Puerto Rico, a little bit away. And while it was there, the CIA entered the shed, contaminated the sugar, completely contaminated that sugar. And John Kennedy found out about this from a briefing that they had ruined 80,000 bags of sugar going to the Soviet Union that had picked and harvested from uh, Cuba. And John Kennedy said the following statement, he was furious, in quotes, it could set a terrible precedent for chemical sabotage in an undeclared struggle between the West and communist countries. Now, the people that contaminate the lettuce that want an economic hardship on Cesar Chavez are doing the identical thing. Charles Colson of the CIA the same one that was involved with Howard Hunt and these other uh, messages, the IDT I spoke about, left the White House just about a few weeks ago 
to work for the Teamsters that is out to break Cesar Chavez, Charles Colson, the attorney for the CIA for the many, many years, is working for the Teamsters Union, and the Teamsters is fighting Cesar Chavez. The same Colson that worked for the CIA when the chemical sabotage came down on Cuba he is working for the Teamsters now when there's chemical sabotage coming down to ruin the lettuce market, and it's coming from Standard Oil. It's a organic phosphate so chemical monitor for the news this week is that the licensees that have this chemical will not be punished. This is in quotes. San Jose Mer